the week after. We'll see how we go. And I was looking at some stuff on the leper Naaman, and I just wasn't happy, had no peace at all because God had a message for Ron to share about the leper Naaman. And he's going, no, no, Michael, not yet. That'll come up in a couple of weeks when Ron speaks. So let's welcome Ron. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I can't beat that, can I? You know, that's pretty good, isn't it? So. I'm going to put my notes here, but it's a useless <laughs> exercise, but it doesn't really matter, but it looks good. It looks as if I'm prepared. Probably they think if you don't have notes, then you're not going to waffle. But if you do have notes, you can get a full treatise on the whole chapter, which probably you don't really want. How was your week? How was your last month, last year? Did you have a good time? Did you have a lot of social engagements and things that, yeah, was good to go to? I had a lot. And funny thing, they all seem to have the same initial DR in front of them. And so, and when I was there one day, the doctor came out of his surgery and went to the desk and the guy raced up and grabbed his arm and said, Doc, Doc, you've really got to help me. I'm shrinking. I'm shrinking. And the doctor patted him on the arm and said, you'll just have to be a little patient. I'm... Sorry, sorry, Carolyn, but dad jokes do have to come. My style of preaching, for those who haven't heard me before, and there are many of you here today who haven't, and that's why you're here. <laughs> but it's, um, I like to grab a passage and tear it apart and look into it and even perhaps give my own interpretation of the background or what happened. If you go to a college, they'll tell you that's a style called exegesis, but Michael uses that also. And so, so that's where we come from today. But there's one important thing as we go through interpreting scripture there is a scarlet thread of redemption, and it goes through every book. this Bible, it's called the Scarlet Thread of Redemption. If you'd like to read it, anybody would, you're quite welcome. It's in what they call the New King James. What it does, it says that in every book of the Bible, there is an evidence of a scarlet thread of redemption. Why scarlet? Because scarlet means blood. You can only be redeemed by blood. You can only be brought back to God by blood. It started off in the Garden of Eden, didn't it? When Adam and Eve sinned and couldn't face God and couldn't work with him and God said, there's a way out for this. You have to be brought back to me by blood. And so he killed an animal. The first blood was shed so he could keep clothe them. And so it carried on through Scripture. Forty different authors over 400 years, all different backgrounds, doctors, fishermen, tax collectors, you name them, prophets, kings, all put together a book. Now, you'd think that'd be such a hodgepodge of nonsense, but it's not. Because right through every book in that Bible is it's called a scarlet thread of redemption. It means that it speaks of your being able to be redeemed from the sin that's in your life through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what's evident in each book. And we're going to find that today. We're going to find that today in our reading. We're going to look at a sickness that probably none of us would really like. Who would like a sickness that was so contagious but yet deadly? Carolyn's going to read to us now that first 
section in 2 Kings 5, and Val will put that reading up, as you can see, and we'll look at the first eight verses. Well, I'm going to read it from the message just to confuse From the you. message, that's yep. okay. Naaman was general of the army under the king of Aram. He was important to his master, who held him in the highest esteem because it was by him that God had given victory to Aram, a truly great man but afflicted with a grievous skin disease. It so happened that Aram, on one of its uh, uh, raiding expeditions against Israel, captured a young girl who became a maid to Naaman's wife. One day she said to her mistress, Oh, if only my master could meet the prophet of Samaria, he would be healed of the skin disease. Naaman went straight to his master and reported what the girl from Israel had said. Well, then go, said the king of Aram, and I'll send a letter of introduction to the king of Israel. So he went off, taking with him about 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothes. Naaman delivered the letter to the king of Israel. The letter read, when you get this letter, you'll know that I've personally sent my servant Naaman to you. Heal him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he was terribly upset, ripping his clothes to pieces. He said, am I a God with the power to bring death or life that I get orders to heal this man from his disease? What's going on here? That king's trying to pick a fight. That's what. Elisha, the man of God, heard what had happened, that the king of Israel was so distressed that he'd ripped his robe to shreds. He sent word to the king, why are you so upset, ripping your robe like this? Send him to me so he'll learn that there's a prophet in Israel. So Naaman, with his horses and chariots, arrived in style and stopped at Elisha's door. Thanks, Carolyn. There's a little bit in there, isn't there, that we can unpack. And if you know me, I'll be looking at the cheekiest ways to unpack it. <laughs> First of all, there's a very important person. Who's the most important person in that passage? The girl. She was a captive of the Aramans who then were captured by Naaman. She was a young Jewish girl captured as a slave. How do you reckon her chances would be? What do you think her life would be? But she was able to be sent to the house of Naaman to be a maid of Naaman's wife. Now, some would call that she was lucky. But, you know, I don't believe in luck in God's purposes for you and for me. I don't believe I've been lucky to have an operation that went so successful. I believe that was God inspired by that man. You see, we can look at our lives and see things that are happening, but it's not by luck, because luck is by chance. She was there for a purpose. And what was that purpose? Her purpose was to, and again, when you think about this, she had the audacity to go to her mistress and speak. Normally, if that would have happened, she could have been slapped across the face three or four times and kicked out of the kitchen or room. She had no right to speak to her master unless invited to. But she risked. Why? Because she cared for her master and because she was there on a mission from God. Not that she probably knew it, but God was able to use her to give the message to the mistress. And the mistress passed it on to Naaman. Now, Naaman, he was a great, great commander. He was very, very good at what he did. You could say that he was like um, General Dwight Eisenhower, who took over the whole forces of the invasion of 
Europe in 1944. He was someone similar to that, of that standing in society. He was revered wherever he went. There were so many victories that he had given Syria during that time. And he was a friend of no one more higher than the king. And so he goes to the king, his friend, and he tells him in verse 4, he tells him, now my maid has said to me that there is a prophet in Israel that can heal of leprosy. Now the king writes a letter and says, I'll give you this letter of introduction. You can take that with you. And besides, take 300 kilos of silver and take 75 kilos of gold, 6,000 shekels and 10 cents sets of clothing. Wow. So he sets off and he goes to the king, Jeroboam in Israel. Now, as that set out, you could imagine there would be a cavalcade because there wouldn't only be his self on a horse riding. Of course not. He was the second in the land. He was a celebrity. He was important. And so he had with him an entourage. He had a cohort of troops. Why? Well, they had a lot of money, didn't they? slung over mules' backs. He would have had camels. He would have had chariots. And he would have had a special chariot that he rode in front. He would have been dressed in his battle dress. So the people seeing this cavalcade come with, with the carts of the cooks and the servants and everybody else that came with him would have been thinking, is this a prelude to an invasion? What's going to happen here? And then he gets, he gets the invite to come and see the king. Now, that wasn't just easy. He couldn't just walk into the palace and say, can I have a chat with King Jeroboam, please? Because I'm Naaman. No, that didn't happen. There had to be protocols. And he wouldn't have gone just to see the king on his own. The king would have had his court with him. And Naaman would have had officials that he would have taken with him as he went, and so he hands the king the letter. But what did the letter say? The letter said, this man, I want you to heal of leprosy. Was that what Naaman told him, that the girl, would have been like those things where you hear one story and you go to the next one and you go to the next one and you go to the last one, and by the time it's got there, it's completely, or was it that he was old he was old because it said that later on that he needed to lean on Naaman's arm or was it that he was not the sharpest tool in the shed or would it have been that he was a little bit deaf and so that's how he sent the letter to King Jeroboam and so Naaman thinks this is a beaut I've got this letter away I go so when the king reads the letter what happens he has a dummy spit doesn't he he had a dummy spit of a major, major dummy spit. What? He said, does he think that I can give life or take life? What does he think I am? He said, I think he's just spoiling for a fight and I'm ready for him. Now, when he said that, he tore his clothes. I brought some shirts. I haven't worn it much. Why? Because it doesn't have a collar. Oh, no. Oh, now I can hear the cabinet. Now I'm angry. I'm going to tear this shirt. Somebody, that's the best important thing I've ever heard about. Look, I don't know if anybody can tear that shirt, but I'm angry and I want to tear my shirt in anger. I can't tear it. Now, 
I think Jeroboam is either a very strong man and what would happen to his anger when he couldn't tear it? You want to tear this shirt or this cloak or whatever it is that he's got and you can't tear it, which is making you madder and madder and all the court officials are looking and you're becoming more embarrassed and more mad. So you know what they did? You know what they did? The court officials knew, they knew that this could happen. So later on, what they did, they didn't get the court tailors to make his clothes. No, they got them from China. And then they went to Best and Less and they got all those clothes so that when he got them, he could rip them straight away. He didn't feel bad at all. But you know that king of Syria? He had a few marbles, didn't he? Because why? What were some of the things that he sent as a gift? Ten sets of clothing. He knew the king was going to go through one lot. And so he had one set ready to go. Now, it doesn't say how many clothes he tore. And I don't think it would be prudent for us to decide how many he did go through but he did enough to show them that he was angry. A second thing. So we've had two important people so far, haven't we? We've had the servant girl. We've had the king of Syria. And now we hear in the scriptures, it says, but Elijah heard that the king was angry and tore his clothes and said to him, oh, kingy boy, why are you worried? That's not your realm. I can do that. I can show him that I can heal him of his leprosy and show that there is no better prophet or God in Israel. Sorted. You don't have to worry. And besides, because I'll do that, you've got nine sets of clothes. How about I get them from my op shop that I've got at the back of my church and we can get rid of the others for you. So that's a fair deal, wasn't it? You know, I told you that there's going to be a little imp that'll tell me to say things that I shouldn't say, but sometimes it does come out. Renee's going to bring us now the second part of the story and we're going to read from verse 9 to 19. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a message to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Bara, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so accept now a present from your servant. But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Then Naaman said, if not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth. For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any God, but the Lord. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes to the house of Rimon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Rimon. When I bow myself in the house of Rimon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. He said to him, go in peace. 
But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, do you want me to keep reading? Yep. The cl you. cliffhanger, verse 20. No. <laughs> yep, yep. That's, that's fine. He just told him to go. Oh, that's it. Go home. Okay. Yep. Go in peace. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Renee. What have we got to unpack, unpack from that? First of all, Naaman sets his GPS and finds the house of Elisha. He goes and raps on the door, fully expecting the man of God would come out and bow before him because he was such a celebrity and a dignity. He would then wave his hand over him and ask the God to heal him. Did that happen? <laughs> no. So what did Elijah do? He did the most outrageous insult that he could think of. He sent his servant out to give him a message. He didn't even bother to go to the door and meet with Nathan. And the servant came out and said, my master said, if you'll go to the River Jordan and you'll wash seven times, when you come up, you'll be healed with the skin of a youth. Now, goodbye, shut the door. So Naaman's standing there looking at the closed door. He's got all his entourage behind him. He's now feeling slighted. He's feeling insulted. He's feeling courtesy hasn't been given to him. I should expect in Eastern culture the courtesy. He should come and kiss me on both sides of the cheek and so will I do that to him and that is our normal practice. He hasn't even bothered to come to the door. He could just wave his hand over me and say, be healed in the name of my God and I can walk away and it's all fixed, isn't it? So in a sulk and in a rage, he climbs back into this fabulous chariot that he had. He was about to flick the horses to move and these officers came and spoke to him. Again, the third people involved. Now, the officers again took a liberty. They weren't supposed to be talking to their commander without an invitation, but they were concerned. And so they said to him, Sire, if you were asked to do something really, really, really difficult, would you have done it? Yes, of course. But you've been asked to go and wash in the Jordan seven times and you'll be healed. That's what the prophet said. What option do you have? Isn't that not too hard? Have you got anything to lose? And so they were able to convince Naaman to do it. Now, Naaman, and it said, with all the horses and the chariots and all his entourage, then turned around and went down to the bank of the River Jordan. Can you imagine that happening and nobody coming? Nobody watching? Nobody coming around? They would have heard about his coming days before. There would have been hundreds of people around. There would have been hundreds. There was the whole entourage of his court. There was his soldiers. There would have been people like servants and cooks and everything who were there. When was the last time you skinny dipped? Go on. Who's, got a, who's game enough to put a hand up and say they've skinny dipped? I see a few. Yeah, a few of us have. Yeah. I remember doing it once when I was about nine or something. Yeah. <laughs> That's not too bad, was it? Yeah, but there's an ulterior motive. You see, I wasn't supposed to jump in the creek and get the little boat that we'd made because unless there was a, an adult there, but that didn't matter. I took my clothes off and jumped in because if I had jumped in with my clothes on and they came back home and well, I was wet. Well, I would have got a whelping and 
because I've been jumping in the pool into the creek. But anyway, that didn't happen. So I made sure I skinny dipped. Yes, and so the last time you skinny dipped, you wouldn't have wanted hundreds of people standing around gaping and gawking at you. I think, in my interpretation, that his entourage would have set up a barrier for the king, for the, the uh, general to go to. Now, when he went to prepare for this, what did he have to do in practical things? What did he have to do? He couldn't go in with all his clothes on, could he? So first of all, he had to take off his helmet. Now, his helmet was the pride of the commander because in the helmet was all the plumes of victory. In the helmet showed his standing and rank. So first of all, he had to take off his helmet. He then had to take off his breastplate. He then had to remove his trousers. He had to do that in front of all his troops and all his entourage. How embarrassing that must have felt and humiliating for him. He was a very proud man. He had a very big ego because he was one of the most famous celebrities in the place. But now he's having to take all this off. Why? I'll tell you why. Because it was God's plan. It was God's plan. He had to divest himself of all that the worldly things had made him. He had to be stripped of all what he had acquired and accrued and been given. He had to be taken back, as it were, to nothing. All those things that he had acquired didn't matter because they didn't heal him. There was no known cure for leprosy at that time. And so when he did take off his, all his clothes, it would have been evident to those who were watching that he had leprosy. He could have hidden some of it because it was only in the early stages of this leprosy. But now that was exposed. And he was exposed for what he was, a leper. Now, God did not want to treat a commander of the Syrian army. God was prepared to treat Naaman the leper. So it was with Naaman the leper that went into the water. It had nothing to do with what he had gained in life. And as he went into the water and went down, no doubt there was gasps of the crowd as he came up first time and the second time and the third time and the fourth time. The fifth time now they must have been thinking, ah, oh, it's not going to happen, is it? And the sixth time there was the gasp again, nothing. He rose from the water the seventh time and his skin was as a young child, completely cured. The scarlet thread of redemption here in this story. God is at work. He works in his ways that are unique to him. Mightn't be the way we would do things, but that was the way God worked to heal this man, but not only did he have to heal him on the outside, he had to heal him on the inside. That was the most important healing. He was now changed from this arrogant, gruff general to a humble, humble man full of humility and thankfulness. Because what did he want to do after that? He wanted to show what was happening in his life. He wanted to share what was happened to him, what had happened to him. He wanted to say, I want to thank this man of God. 
And so he went back to the house with all his entourage. He went back and there he found Elisha. And Elisha was prepared to talk to him because it was God's plan, of course. And he said to Elisha, there is no greater God than the God here in Israel. This is the God that I will follow for the rest of my life. I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much. I want to give you all these gifts. I want to give you gifts. Please take them. And Elisha said, no, I've got the suit, so I'm right. No, he didn't say that at all. He said, look, go in peace. But he said, look, I've got some problems. He said, whenever I go back to Syria, I will not give incense or give sacrifices to any other god. But there will be an occasion when I have to take the king to the temple of his god because he needs to lean on my arm to take me there. But I said, he said, I will not worship him. So he said, can I take some soil from here? And so they filled up a few sacks of soil and threw it on the mule. And he would have that soil in his house where he could kneel in that soil and feel so close to the God that he had now accepted into his life. Wonderful story, isn't it? You know, you wonder when you read these stories, what's the purpose of it for me? The purpose is it for me is that those people were instrumental in this end result. Those single people doing what they did was part of God's plan, was part of God's plan for this new life that Naaman now enjoyed. Do you know, has it been any different from for you and for me? Have you found that there was no answer to the barrenness and the bankruptcy of your life before you met Jesus? Had all the world offered you so many answers? Of course they hadn't. Only Jesus can give us the answer to those problems. And only Jesus can make us feel worthwhile. And you may feel, why am I here? But you're here now because God has placed you here. God has placed you here like he placed that girl, like he placed that king, like he placed those officers at the right time and the right place for his plans to work. And that's the same for each one of us here today. We're here for that purpose. Allow God to use you, to develop you, to enable you to serve, and to love him more each day. Naaman had to learn a lesson of humility so that God could come into his life. Let that be so for each one of us today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that even stories from the Old Testament where perhaps we couldn't see any evidence of your redeeming love, but they are there because your word is so true. And we believe in the inspired word of God. We believe in every word of it because it was written by not anybody else but the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guided men and women to put these words into action. And so, Father, today you've blessed us. Perhaps we didn't know anything about Naaman before, but now we've learned about this man. Now we've learned about your plans for each one of us. We've learned that he had these plans for Naaman for so long. But Naaman had to be humble and brought down from his earthly state to be able to receive what God had for him. Help us to do today, to honour you with our lives, to be willing to serve and love you more at each day. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand and sing our final song.
You're the one, the you are the God, you are the God that's in my soul. Oh, you reign, surround friends like God in my heart. It's up to you. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, conqueror. I will sing to the night. Christ is risen and on high. Is he living in me that in the world? No surrender, no retreat. We are free. We will declare this all day. We are you are not bound to sin or to shame. We are the fire in your name. You are the fire that cannot be taken. You are the power. Nothing is impossible. Every chain is breaking you. We are victorious. A Nothing is impossible, and every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. You are stronger You are greater with you. We are victorious. We are more than conquerors. You are the fire that you are the power in our Lord, our God. We are the Lord, we are not bound to sin or to shame. We are the fire that cannot be taken. You are the power that our God has found to Okay, after the service, there'll be some bottles of water um, from the River Jordan. Uh, they're $10 a bottle, and if you pour it on yourself seven times, you will have clear skin. <laughs> Just kidding, folks. <laughs> okay, please go and have a wonderful week and enjoy morning tea. Thank you. <laughs>